are in these uh, in these times. So with this, I, I I kind of equate your profession um, and what I do to this. Okay, it's it's what makes these guys successful, and we'll we'll see if we can get through it. So everybody's got a job. If you look, everybody's picking rocks up. They're getting ready. They're even going, rolling the tires. And then this is Ferrari and now the car is gone. So what I'm doing is, is, is saying, okay, there's a, I usually show one that's a fail first and that's not knowing what your job is, not knowing what you have access to, not really zoning in on specifically what you do in the chain of command of things. And um, that makes all the difference in the world. So if you have your mind mentally focused and everyone's minds mentally focused on what they're doing and the timing's right, you get a championship level execution. So I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of these different things, but I kept it simple to help kids understand it that are, that are peewees and bantams, um, but a one, two, three ABC theory. So everybody knows their one, two, threes and ABCD theories um, and the rest I can go over really quickly. Yeah, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind explaining all these. Decision to instinct, this Bobrovsky. I don't know if the video is good or not. Yep. But... So watch his head here. You'll see it in a sec. When he comes down, you'll see him kind of looking for the puck, shaking his head here. You'll see it in a sec. <laughs> Did you see that? So, you know, just moving from, from decision to instinct, and we'll move down here. So this is the diagram how it was made um, straight out. And it was um, uh, myself, Mike Valley, Alex Ald. Um, it was a, another goaltending coach from Sweden. We just got together and went, okay, what are the most common elements of what your D zone should look like? And, uh, it, you know, in, in essence, you're going to be receiving uh, players through this area here. You're going to be creating plays here and then so forth. So when a player, the first thing you're doing is recognizing from a turnover, okay, who's on the rush? That's number one is who's coming down on the rush? Is it, you know, do you have two backhand players that have a backhand to backhand reception and a backhand release? Do you have a forehand to a backhand reception? Do you have forehand to forehand reception? Do you have backhand that opens up to, to a forehand receiver? Like all of these things play a role. And the earlier you recognize it, the, the more you're able to make those decisions as they enter your zone. So we're casting our vision beyond it. So maybe it happens in the neutral zone, but as they come across that line, recognizing whether it's an odd man or an even man rush is really important, just like you'd said. So we did a little study and we had Jake Allen stand in here and Dave Alexander from the St. Louis Blues measured um, when he stood at 25, 50, 75, 100, and 125% of the crease with the cords. I learned the cords uh, from Chico Resch's true angle I think 25 yep. years ago, well, I, I, I had one. Of, I had the device. Uh, I had the device too until I shot and broke it. But it was a great piece of, you know. Then I used up to six ropes and, uh, you know, all those things. We've all been through these types of things. And the main thing was is the delivery was measuring from the shoulder and how can we make this a six inch game. Um, so we went through that and Dave actually measured this and sent, sent it back to uh, to our group and it was. The difference between 25 and 125 is four inches. So you're basically making an inch. Every time you step out, you've got an inch, a little, a little bit less uh, as, you're coming, as you're coming out. In essence, as you're coming out there, you have a six inch game if you, if you follow exactly what I'm sharing, but you'll have, an even, uh, you'll have a little bit of a bigger game if you, uh, or a little bit more space if you back up a little bit. So you know you'll have to stretch out to make certain saves. Going straight into zone entry, if it's an even man rush, your heels are on top of the crease and you're presenting yourself into position and receiving, you're receiving the play, receiving the rush, and then making your saves. If it's odd, man, your toes are at the top of the crease and then you're using what, timing what, mechanisms. What, I was going to ask your thoughts on this, Pasco is, yeah. um, and you got to remember how old I am here, yeah. but back in my day, those rules, I guess the only thing, um, you get a guy like Patrick Waugh, who is more kind of, he would apply this rule. What I would see is he would apply this rule, but he would be more 
stationary where you got a guy like Dominic Hasek who would apply this rule, but he would be more of a flow goalie. Like he would be, so he'd come out and he would, it would be more, more timing. Right. And so like, I see it with Braden Holpe, like Braden's more of a come out and, and flow. Like he'd use this, but he would, it would be more of a timing where there's more guys that are more, I don't know if that's the right word, but static. They're, they're not, um, they're not doing more of that, that kind of fl- backward f- flow motion. Does that, that, and, and, I, and, and I go back again, e- e- each to his own, like, uh, um, like if you're the timing of it is, you know, if you got that at uh, odd man rush and you're timing your backward retreat, if it's an odd and you're, you're arriving where your toes are on the top of the crease, I'm like, great. Like, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> any, yeah. any different, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like, I, I agree. Uh, one, I agree 1000%. And I, I know my place, uh, my place is I'm developing goaltenders in the critical area for, uh, you know, for major junior hockey, or if I'm dealing with a pro, I'm always talking about like, this is basically, if we look at the rail and braille, meaning the very beginning or the trade, the, the training wheels, it's a starting point. And then the customization plays a role. The best way to explain it is this way. These are uh, shootouts. Now this is, I'm gonna show you a bunch of goalies really quick and this is Niemi. So let's put the rule into place. Okay, so what we're gonna do is when I do this, we're going to, let me just uh, get ready here. So where is he when the puck touches the hash mark? His heels. Top, Top of the, of the crease, crease, right? Yep. So he's got good head trajectory and he's got that his gloves are he's got absolutely. that kick in it. Let's watch it again. It's a different one. Yep. Right. So there he is again, right? He has his flow, but he finds his, he finds his, uh, his, where he needs to go. Here's another one. Okay. Heel on top of the crease again. Now I'll move ahead to another goalie. These are the top 13 goalies and shootouts back in, I did a study back in 2013. So there's Bobrovsky. Where's his heels? Top yeah. of the crease. So then you look at other goalies. Right. There's Lundquist. Pretty yep. close. Let's go again. I'll just move it ahead to another goalie. Right, can't really see on this one as much, but you get the idea. And let's go again one more time. Right, so as soon as they get, they get to that first hash mark, let me just, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but we'll see, almost. But you get you get what I'm saying. There's Tuka Rask now. Uh, we'll go one more. So it, all it is is the rail and braille, right? So as soon as they get to that spot, they're at the top of their crease. Whether they have flow, like Ryan Miller comes out really, really far. Um, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's not a case of making. Um, uh, it's not a case of making me right. For example, it's not. It's not about us being right. It's about saying this is a starting point. And then you can start your backwards, you know, your backwards flow or whatever you want at a certain point in the ice that's visible in every rink, rather than saying, you know, backwards skate when he gets to the Campbell Soup logo on the wall. Well, you can't really do that because you can only do it in one rink. So uh, the main objective is, is that whether you come out or not, you want to tr- roughly be in that position once those players start getting into that critical uh, in rink zone where you're able to make those those saves. Um, as you come down on the side here, as soon as you come down here, if you can see my, my arrow, you make zone entry, but say you're, you're ahead of everybody else and you come into this area. Well, there's several different things that can happen. The first one is the shot or the net drive, which is basically called the shot player comes this way, moves over here and they'll either net drive or they'll shoot the puck. That's number one. And number two, number three, they'll come down. The defenseman will do a great job and they'll do what? they'll delay. And when they delay, that's a great opportunity for the goalie to scan for the next most dangerous player, because when they delay, they're either going to feed up anywhere across this line, they'll feed midline or across the Royal Road, 
they'll throw it right at the crease for a deflection or the centerman beats this player and goes on the on the strong side for support so he then gives him the puck and then drives the net for a shot on goal if this right here is the penalty box and this is the player's box when that player delays and notices that he's got no help he's going to carry that puck down in here and freeze the puck because he wants to wait for help and have these guys come off the boards and help him if the, he's coming down this side and he looks and scans and sees everybody doing a line change and coming off he's going to do a hard rim so that they can maintain possession while he curls out and gets off the ice so with one scan in recognition of what they're doing they can see eight options that'll happen and if that player turns he's not shooting he's passing and if that player doesn't pass because he's got no help because you scanned and saw nobody, you didn't see anybody that for it to help him, you know he's going to hold on to the puck or he's going to hard rim it depending on what side the ice he's going to be on. So all of these are just being able to mentally predict what a player is going to do on that half wall. Now, when you watch the games this afternoon or tonight, you're going to see, like, if you adopt that same theory, you're going to be like, oh, my God, like, watching the game now is like, it's, it's the game's slow. I know what they're going to do. And that really is the process is how do we slow the game down? Well, we don't, we just recognize what's happening a lot faster because it's all laid out for us. And then the other side, now there's not 10 ways to score, but these are the ones that Finland has come up with. And I, I agree with them. You can get up to 32 of them. I know a goalie coach in the NHL that uses 32 scoring situations. I think if we start putting a list together, then we start getting the same, um, problems and same responses from goaltenders that's too many i don't want to think about all these things i don't want to think about all these lists if i break that list on the right hand side down shot pass and puck possession carry so if i don't do the first two that's shooting and, and trying to score that's out if i do the next uh, four that all has to do with with uh, passing and if he doesn't pass and he's got no support He's only got two left, get, maintain possession through skating or through rimming. And um, so that's, that's really one of the attributes behind it. Could there be a ninth option or a 10th option? Absolutely. But we're trying to encompass it into, um, based on what's happening, can I recognize the next most dangerous situation? And where should I be placing the puck if I do stop that puck in a vulnerable position? Am I elevating it, controlling it, catching it, smothering it? Am I distributing it to another defenseman uh, on our team? Like what is going to help me through that process? And, and that's where uh, like, you know, Mitch had said like the soft spots, we used to call it knowing, knowing where to put the puck out of harm's way. Yeah. You know, I used to get ripped all the time, Pascal, like, especially on if they were on the goalie was on the, uh, the PK. Well, sometimes the best place to put the rebound is right in the high spot because if they box out properly, there, there's no, there's no one there. And right. so if, but if a goalie went back and said, Hey, you know, my goalie coach told me to put the puck, you know, into the high, the rebound into the high slot. Well, you'd be like, Oh, get rid of that goalie coach. But again, <laughs> it's, it's situation. It's situation. dependent. Absolutely. And like you look at, uh, I always refer to Anaheim. I go look at who they had on the D on the D in the D zone, uh, protecting the Anaheim ducks. Where did the coaches want the puck, the rebound to go? They wanted to go back out to the Niedermeyers. So yeah. they're the, they were the strongest D-man. They don't want it in the corner because they weren't going to beat a team that was faster because they were really big. And so it's better off just giving them possession because they, they've they got it. I mean, who would you rather give the puck to, Datsuk, or take a chance by going to 50-50 in the corner? So, you know, on, on Detroit. So these situations allow a goaltender to scan and recognize what's going to happen. Now, here's the secret behind the zones. It's the key to that is just like, what are the things that you want to do? There's four major things that I think a goaltender um, needs to do in order to be super effective. Because if you and I were in the net, John, the main thing is that if we're stopped and set in position and the player stopped and set in position and he shoots and, and we're reacting to it, that's our best chance to stop the puck. We're stopped. We're balanced. We're in control. We've got proper head uh, you know, alignment and trajectory. We've got good rate right vision. Our hands are in the right spot, sticks in the right spot. We're in a good, strong stance. So. We want to try to recreate that. So the first thing about a zone is it locks the player into a position. It, lo it stops the player from moving because when you're in zone one, let's say, which by the way is one John Stevenson, that's the width of that zone. 
Uh, zone two is two John Stevensons, and zone yeah. three is three John Stevensons. In order to create, uh, in order to get the proper protection from John Stevenson and create a one John Stevenson, I have to move out. So right. when you're starting to look at this, I'm locking the player into position, so you really can't move. He's he's in that zone, and I'm standing in that zone. Um, and and, that, and that's why you're saying like just the best thing to do in, in zone one is just you, you're, you're taking the real estate. So now it's just being patient. It's just exactly. less is Let more. Let him do whatever he wants to do because the net space is only a certain width, right? So you start looking at that and going, okay, I've locked the player, the puck. I've stopped the net from moving. So not if I stop the puck from moving, the player from moving and the net from moving. The last thing I need to do, which comes down to you, uh, is you got to stop the goaltender from moving, not to stop them from thinking, but to stop the goaltender from moving. And if you've stopped all four of those things based on using zones or layers of depth, you have a really great opportunity to maximize your positioning and your depth management. Because just like you, when I ask goalie coaches, hey, how do you teach depth management? It's silent in the room because it's complicated. It's, it's very wordy. You have to really think about your actions. And most goaltending coaches that are out there um, are usually doing one-on-one -on -one work. The problem is the game is sometimes four or five guys, maybe six guys on the ice. So we have to think about what we're trying to recreate. And that's where we come into uh, the 10 ways to beat a goaltender or the scoring situations. And that's one of the reasons why Pascal, like for me, there's, there, there's a couple of primary reasons why I do five ball juggling. Um, one is that, the eyes are a muscle and like Josh Tucker would talk about is he is you're strengthening that, that muscle. Right. So if you're just doing three, three ball juggling all the time, my metaphor of that is like, well, then all you're doing is you're bench pressing the bar. You're, you're squatting the bar all summer. And what we need to do is keep adding resistance. Right. But then I'll always right. say to guys, well, so what we're doing by going from three to four to five ball juggling is we're strengthening the eye muscles and we're strengthening our peripheral. But the reason why five is because there's five guys on the ice. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want guys eventually to get the five ball juggling mm -hmm. because now you're simulating what you're gonna experience on, on the ice. Right. And so, and you wanna do that juggling um, where you're also, you could be reading, like you could be looking you, or you have a, a, your goalie coach, your goalie partner, where he's calling out, he's, he's put, his, put his hand up and now what he's doing, you have to call out the number while simultaneously doing that, because right. now what that is, the guy's hand is representing the shooter and the balls are representing your teammates and the opposition. Right. And that's what I try to explain. Like you're not doing five ball juggling to, to get into the circus or pick up beautiful girls. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing it because we're yeah. trying, that's, that's a skill that we're going to be using you know, in, in, in the, in these zones, yeah. the, the, the question I wanted to ask you, Pasco, if, if, and because I'm, I, you know, I, it's been 13 years since I coached in, uh, in, in the NHL and the dub, could yeah. you maybe explain to me a little bit about this overlap? Because I, I go back again, if we're doing the box controller, the, the, the ropes, what I'm trying to understand is, wouldn't and maybe i'm way off that's why that's why i'm asking but no. if if i'm if i'm in an overlap then i don't understand the science to it because for me it's like one i'd be touching the ropes <laughs> i'd be outside of the ropes um and if it does and i see a lot of guys where like you said if you're in um if you're in zone one um and you just if you're in the proper piece of the pie, if you want to call it, then really what you're doing is you're forcing the shooter. You're in charge, not the puck in charge of you. And now to me, you're almost kind of making this guy, okay, I have to do a lateral. Like I have to go East West or something to that effect or go, you know? And so to me, if I'm in the overlap one, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm giving the guy far side, but I'm also making myself vulnerable that if, if he does throw it, you know, east west, I've got to make this big lateral ad adjustment where if I was within the box, now for me, I go back to that less is more. Like, I, I think if you look at a guy like Flurry and you look at when he first came into the league and what he and what you see him do now, 
Um, you know, part of it is age, I'm sure, but he, he, he moves way less than he ever used to. And, yeah. and so I, I wasn't sure, like, when Economy did the overlap? You answered, yeah, like we, you answered your own question too, John. And this is a, the reason why I, I teach this too, is the fact that you see down at the bottom there, it, it, you've got that, that line that I'm pointing to right here. I, I took it off. So that's why I like to keep this, but <clears throat> this line right here is the decision-making line in the ABCDs. So that's okay. the dead angle. So there's three different things that you could use in this situation, but there's a reason or there's a, yeah, there's a reason when and why you'd use the different aspects. So after researching this, and I'm not saying I'm hundred percent right. I'm just saying that what I try to go for is they're going to stop the puck at the highest level they possibly can, which means maybe they'll get, if they execute how I'm teaching it, they'll get a plus 95% chance they're going to stop it. And they'll get a high percentage chance that you're going to control a rebound. And that is if you've got no backside pressure or you've got no East West option, meaning that the player is now raced th through the neutral zone, he's now coming down zone two and going to the Crosby spot where he's got that backhand upstairs, or he's got where you get a shooter in here. <clears throat> if he's by himself, a good one to use would be the overlap because there's no danger of the East West pass or backdoor pass, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Despite the noise, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Now, mass is there. So he might not even have to stop a shot. Back to Mitch Korn's conversation with you, is it? it's a game of what? Is it a game of shots yeah. or stops? So it, he, <clears throat> this goaltender basically stopped the puck without this puck even being shot. So the overlap is nothing more. It's just goalie coaches coming up with fancy terms, but really all it is is just releasing the blade off the post enough so that when you go into a butterfly you don't kick yourself away from the post which you already know but it's just in front of the post so you can execute a butterfly and you're maintaining net center position between the ropes that you're talking about is allowing that puck to hit mass because rather than leaving it up to chance where you're playing maybe a little deeper which i think you could very easily play deeper and go into a vh or just let it hit you um you know, coming out in an overlap gives goaltenders a bit more comfort because they know that they can, their percentage chance of missing it is very, very low. Now, that being said, saw, go ahead. Because I, I, I saw your uh, your presentation about why the, the VH for, for women compared to RVH for the women. And I, 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 I agree. Like, I, yeah. I really liked it. Um, yeah. I think know, all it, those it, things it was, are based on puck proximity too. Like, if you're if you're coming down on that side and you're above the goal line going into an rvh is extremely dangerous because in north america there's a lot of rush to teaching the reverse vh um and from distance it's proven like if you look at one of my videos online it's like guys making mistake after mistake after mistake using rvh when the puck is north of the goal line they're getting torched upstairs because these guys don't need a lot of space and if you've got distance and you've got space and some time you're going to get you're going to get beat or they're just going to shoot at your head so it's it's important to just maintain your position and even the overlap there's strengths and weaknesses to it um but say the vh a lot of people don't like to do it because they can't you know they can't use the hinges properly on the on the on the door frame there and they tend to fall away from the post so they need to use or be strong using a dead arm or, or using your elbow to lock yourself in the upper portion of the net so that you can drop down and get hit or struck by the puck. You also need to point your toe where you want the puck to go. So uh, that becomes an issue because people always go into the post with their heel and they leave that triangular space open behind the knee. So there's a time and place for it. I think the RVH you're going to start seeing, and this is just me, I think you're going to start seeing guys wait until they've go, gone down below the goal line. And then uh, when they reach this timing mechanism, they're going to move into the net a little bit. So you can't bank it off of them. And then when they come up, they're going to close down on that net space, uh, okay. whether it's here or whether it's on the other side for the RVH. But even this reverse tracking, like I'm not going to say anything uh, like critic criticizing uh, Ian Clark or, 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 um, you know, Thatcher Demko using the, they call it the reverse tracking method, which is skate to skate to post and looking over your shoulders. But I think as players start recognizing that they're going to start really hovering around these areas for those passes. And they're going to, when these guys come around, they're going to 
blast them upstairs. Right. Um, and I could be wrong because I don't, I, I've, I've talked to Ian Clark a few times and, and know him, but I haven't gotten into the what, why, when, how, and, and, you know, behind it. But to them, the goaltenders don't have a lot of time. They're big guys. So locking down the, or sealing the ice becomes extremely important. And maybe they have lots of confidence in their deed and not let those passes out to those critical areas. So there's the difference between minor hockey, junior hockey, major junior hockey, and, and pro. But um, that's that's why we limit it. There's only like I look at it, three options. You got no backside pressure. You got an overlap. You got you got a guy coming in to shoot the puck in zone one, stand there, or do the VH, and the puck will end up going back into the corner out the same zone again. So you don't have to move as much. And then if the guy comes down below the goal line to come and attack you, then that's when you're going to use your RVH, get close to the puck, disrupt the the uh, the pathway of the puck, so that you you have a lot more freedom. You've you've actually shrunk the whole net space down. Now, if you don't mind me asking, like um, there was a goal the other night in the overtime where uh, Pitts, Pittsburgh beat Carter on a wraparound. Yeah. And again, this is just me. I um, I don't get like for me, I I wanted to ask your 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 opinion and more importantly, why. But the more and more I've looked at goals against RVH wise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, toe bridge on the post to me seems to be the one that I'd be if I got back into goalie coaching which I have no I no plan of doing yeah. but I would almost be teaching kids to do more of the toe bridge um one just because I, it seems like it's a better seal um you can get a better push um because if if I I the one that Carter got burnt on is like almost a little bit of the Tuka Rask where he got his pad and to me, it doesn't make any sense because if your pad's behind the goal line <laughs> and the puck <laughs> is there, like it's a goal. Like yeah. I don't, I, like that's just me. Um, so for me, it's like when I do that, like we're watching the RVH, um, that was like you said, like I, I thought they were, they were using it at the, it's Mitch's phrase. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how and when you leave your feet. And right. so for me, I, I saw guys, um, you know, like yeah, I remember you showing that one, and then where, we, where who did Carter their, play against? It was it it's uh, was against Pittsburgh. Um, if you go to yeah, go to YouTube, yeah, and and you'll see a, it was the overtime goal, and, and in my opinion, why he gets burnt is when he one I don't, I don't think he tracked it. You know whatever word you want to call visual attachment, I think Eli uses that word, but when he took it behind that didn't track it very well. And then when he actually went to go to execute it, his pad got behind the goal line and that's where, you know, it ended up in, in the net. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, we're, um, yeah, like this. So like, that's, yeah. Like, so for me, I, I, I like, that's where I like, to me, that's not, <laughs> Yeah, you know, obviously he's not square. He got rotated a lot, but uh, that's why I wanted to ask you, like, what, you know, again, part of it is just so I'm, you know, keeping up to date with what goalie coaches are teaching. I'm not seeing anything that, uh, you know, like on that goal, it looked like to me he used the wrong. Where if he would have got into that toe bridge, then he's not getting all twisted around. He's sealing it, but that's just me. I'm just kind of curious, you know, what. Uh, of the three, because there was a, a really cool Instagram post the other day. Which one do you use? Toe bridge, skate, yeah. um, or or pad? So the, the my answer to that, uh, and I'll be a quick answer first, is um, you use all three. And in Carter Hart's position there, the first thing that needs to go um, past that post is going to be the stick. And, and uh, I'm just I'm just burning the, the clip right now. And when we get it up, I'll, uh, I'll utilize it. Um, like I go back, you know, when, like when I played Pasco, like we yeah. there, we would have, we would have shuffled across. Like yeah. we would have stayed, stayed on the guy, stayed up on our feet, shuffled across. And my goalie coach would snap. If ever a pass got between the paint, yeah. like from the, in the, in the paint, yeah, exactly. If yeah. ever, you know, he would lose his mind. And, yeah. and and for me, I'll tell guys like same thing. Like if you're in that RVH, be aggressive, like use your stick, like, you know, 
don't just let guys walk walk through that area. Um, if that, I think is that is that what you're. The, the thing is, is that there's a certain time and place, and a lot of guys haven't gone through this yet. Here's Jimmy Howard when we were doing some of the RVH stuff. So when you're in position, this one here, when you skate on post, is more bumping. So you see how he bumped and gained depth. Yeah. And a lot of guys are overusing this. And what uh, what happens is they use it to go here. But I mean, when I was with the women's national program, we lost a, uh, we lost um, um, a game because Shannon Zabados used to skate on post here. She bumped off of it and then they just jammed it in here. So it's um, there's a time and place for each for each one of those. Um, I think that's good for for uh, for bumping for sure. Let me just see if there's another one here for you. Uh, yeah, let's see it. we're finding it. RVH example, uh, AGL, RVH technical breakdown. Let me just check here and see if there's anything. But then the main the main objective is is that for example, I I agree with you when you're when you're getting into a position and you're and you're a, having a player come in north of the line and you're using an RVH. So let's say that Carter made a save here in the in the in the very critical area and the puck went this way using that lateral toe bridge on post and blocking out is critical that's exactly okay. when you use your toe bridge on post in my opinion because okay. uh it's above the goal line you get an, a critical seal you got some nice width to your to your uh, butterfly and you've also got some good mass to be able to block that secondary shot because let's face it if you just stick your glove there, you might get lucky, um, but you want to block it and just get rid of it. That's why I call it block or butterfly block, because it's that's what we're doing most of the time. When you use toe box or sorry, toe in post, uh, it's for similar situations that Carter was in, but there was too much uh, angle in Carter's position there where he caught the post and spun. He could have used, because Carter's a big guy, easily used toe bridge on post, like you're saying. So that's probably what I would say with Carter is to go right to a toe bridge on post on those types of plays and lock it out because he's a big guy. If it was a younger kid, I would probably get them to use pad in post because there's too much distance between the toe bridge and the knee. And it requires an enormous amount of leaning to be able to cut that other uh, space down, if that makes sense. Um, there's also different ways to play your hand in that position. So one of the things I talked about with Robbie Tallis from Florida when Roberto Luongo was there was hand down um, right in that critical area where it seals the post. I may have a couple of uh, uh, videos that I can show you. I have it on Coach's Eye and I can definitely get this stuff for you and send it off to you. Um, Thank you for, this is, this is awesome. No Thank worry. you so much for doing this. Because I, I left, it was funny. I was joking with with Braden. I I left the game, yeah. Right when this was being induced. So you see that? Yeah. So there's your toe box on post, your toe bridge on post. This is a uh, this is a U.S. national team goalie. So there's the toe bridge on post. There's the glove, and it makes a perfect perfect seal, seal. right on the yeah. post. And then the extension of the glove <laughs> protects that area, and they're close. So they have sight and they have access to the puck, which to me is critical, right? If you don't have this and they come up here, the rebound is definitely going out into the, into the big messy area, right? So this is a really good spot for it. And it also doesn't allow them to bank it off of your back into the net or your head to bang, uh, go into the net, but you're right on top of it right here. So hopefully that makes sense. Like I would have a younger kid obviously slide in and, and preserve their hips and learn the timing first. Then I would introduce toe box and get them to practice the reception, make sure their toe laces are proper. And then the third aspect would be uh, the execution. Now for Carter Hart, uh, Jake Allen, Ben Bishop, all the big guys like that, Braden Holpe, getting in uh, Carter Hart getting into that would be fantastic because they have a big enough body to re really shut this net space down. But a young guy. I know, I, uh, watching Braden, he's always skate on post skate yeah. on like, and, and the only thing I've seen when a lot of guys do skate on post, what I've seen is like, like you mentioned with Shan is um, there was that gap. There was that little bit of space where guys were, you know, if they kept banging at it, banging at it, eventually, it went in. Yeah. 
see there's pad in post where does the shot go upstairs so when you're on the outside it's going in and we'll move to another one here let's see uh i've broken all these down into i don't know how many so like like days. like right here if you don't if that if we can go back to that one pass yep. like yep, what, what sure. i want to ask you here is um this is where you're saying like this would be a really good example of the overlap like no. where you no you couldn't nope. do the overlap here um, this would be, this could be a VH or it would be the same thing you talked about, which is holding your edges because look what you have on the back door coming in. You have this player right, right. here. Who's going to, if they're right. smart, they're going to drive to here. And if you beat this foot, that pucks in the net. Okay. And it looks like he's, he's the timing mechanism in scoring when I'm teaching scoring is when he goes into that post, let's see if the timing is right. As soon as he hits the post, he's passing or he shoots. See that? So if yeah. you think if you think of goaltending as energy, um, this guy is going down, and all of his energy is going down to that section of the post. So he can't come back this way. Exactly. So he's yeah. he's shutting that down like a, like you're dropping a, a Tetris box. When I, yeah, sorry. When I first saw it, I didn't realize there was that back. So I, what yeah, you're no seeing again is if guys coming into that zone and there's no backside pressure like and again where i see a lot of goalies making a mistake with this pass because they don't identify it early like they don't they so like for me I, i'm really trying to try and encourage any of the goalies as soon as that the opposition gets somewhere between their blue line and center ice that's when you're scanning to look for that odd even rule like i right. want them guys or even when the play is down the other end to keep engaged like really yeah. engaged where you're not letting your mind, especially with the Adam and the Pee Wee goalies where they're letting their guy they're you know, who's in the stands. Like what I try to encourage guys to do. And I love you said that three seconds, three, you're, you're, you're in that three seconds. Yeah. It's like, okay, this is the time you're relaxed, but okay. Identify who's on the ice, identify which each, which way each guy's blade is. And then if you're really one of these goalies that are not getting a ton of shots, I mean, where you could start to, you know, fade away. And you mentioned Tony Robbins, the little cliche emotion is created by motion. Sometimes what I'll get guys do to do pass, but not all the time, but yeah. if they're, in, they're on a team where they're getting a shot every freaking five or 10 minutes. I will physically get them to move. I'll get them yeah. to rehearse, you know, move with the play so that they're keeping at least their, their mind and their body alert. Right. But the biggest one that I see guys making a mistake is the puck is already on top of their blue line. And they have no idea if it's an odd man or even, even right. They, like they've got, in my opinion, they got to identify it way sooner than, than what they're doing. Would I'll you use agree myself with that? as an example. When I played junior, I, I mean, I didn't even know until the end of the game and read it in the newspaper that a guy got a hat trick on me, you know? So it's like, you don't even know who scores on you. You have no idea. Like, you know, and that's really what we're dealing with is we expect these, uh, these athletes, even up to the NHL um, to, think like a 40 year old and a lot of them are 18, 20, 22, 25, 27. You know, when we were explaining this to Jimmy Howard, he goes, no one ever told me this stuff. No one ever shared this stuff with me before, you know? So it's, it's really cool to see that they're still looking at that uh, as a, as a positive way. Now you look at this goaltender now going into an RVH. Why are you in an RVH when there's a one-on-one -on -one battle in the corner outside of the trapezoid? And why is your hand in this position? It doesn't have access because if you have to get out to grab the puck, they're going to create a hole there. I'm not sure if he's got, uh, let me just see here if I can zoom in. No, I can't. But um, I could zoom in uh, and try to create it another way and see if, if that's toe box on post, that's fine. Let's see what happens. So he's down on an RVH. Watch a shot. So the, the question is why, why are we, you know, going down into these positions? Like, why would he not be standing, you know? And, and then, and that's all from just getting kind of puck watchy, but this goal should like this. If you want to get an, a, a GM or a head coach upset at you, this is a good way to do that because this guy's got size. He can stand up and there's lots of, uh, lots of uh, ch chances like this. Like, look, like that's what you're looking at in this scenario. Right. And uh, yeah. we could be better. Like these are this, this shot right here. Um, and how many other ones that are similar, not necessarily RVH or are, are in a position where goalies can get into get themselves into a lot of trouble. 
and you said you said something really really key a while ago Pasco, and i agree with you is um you know my brother played pro football and the one thing that he talked a lot about is you get to know guys tendencies they study it and that's what nhl goalie coaches do is they aside from teaching their own goalies they're look they're breaking down the other guys and they're and that's you know, I remember Scotty Murray talking to me a lot about that, like really knowing um, and then passing that information on to their forwards so that they could beat those guys. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you start keep, you know, like I'm, I love that breakdown you did of Vaskaleski, like if that's what guys are doing. So mm-hmm. like if, if you're not making those adjustments along the way, I'm not saying be reactive, but guys are studying you and, and they'll, if they, they know you, it's like my brother used to say, if you can't pivot one way, trust me, they'll, they'll, they'll find quickly it. find, they'll quickly they'll find out and they'll, they'll go after it. They will. Uh, and, 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 and that's, ex- that's the same thing. Like with Carter after his first season to be like, okay, that's great. And Carter wants to play the same way because he had so much success and he came out that season and said, I want to be number one in the league or whatever. I want to be the best goalie in the, in the world, which is a phenomenal goal. These things are, we have to look like as a goalie coach, I'd have to look at him and go, how would I beat my, uh, how would I beat the goaltender that I'm blessed to train? Yeah. Because I know that, you know, at least 30 other guys, 31 other guys are getting yelled at by their general manager to say, how do you beat Carter Hart? Cause I'm not running into this and losing critical games against Philly in our division, because you guys don't know how to beat him. And it's not the fact it's not, they're not weaknesses of Carter's or anybody else. They're just tendencies of how they do it. Now, you know that that goaltender I just showed you will go down on an RVH when the puck goes to the corner. Now you're going to build your plan on how to beat him based on that. Yep. Right. So when we get into, into this stuff, uh, it's very simple. A, B, C, and D. This is D right here. Yeah, it's a decision-making line. Like I said, are you going to use a VH, an RVH, or an overlap? So we just get the guys to kind of practice you know, what you're going to use when a guy comes at you, when a guy goes down and then comes back up again, when a guy goes down here and comes here close, or he goes around the other side, you know, you just run these, I kind of call them player routings, just like they do in football. Like there's, there's patterns that players are going to skate. So it's our job to recreate these patterns so that a goaltender can recognize and go from there. So control is simple. I say, what do you expect to do if you get a shot from out here? What does your coach expect from you? Control it catch it, control it, smother it, spray the glass, elevate it, get it out of play, redistribute it. What about this section right here? The inside of the house, the deadliest spot on the ice. You have enough time to act, react, and recover. You can use whatever term you want, but you have enough time to act, react, and recover. And you can't play way out at the edge of your crease because the, you know, the inverted triangle that we have that comes like this, as soon as you start going out here, you're playing into the strengths of the players. You're not covering more net by coming out here. You have to travel from apex peak to peak way out here to try to to cover it. So you're better off playing here and being able to cover it and gain some depth than you would be to come way out here and have to come way on the other side to stop the puck. So when you're playing deeper, you also have to know what you're giving up because you're splitting the difference. I'm giving up depth to force you to shoot a little bit with a little bit of width. What's the easiest thing to do for goaler? catch to the side versus catching at you or at the, um, you know, at the underarm of the, of the, of the chest protector, um, anything to the outside, it's a lot easier to catch. And Braden Holpe, he just, he made an incredible save the other night. You know, he's brilliant at it. Um, when you shoot to the outside, he's going to snag you all day long. When you change it, I mean, that just gives you an idea of what you want seen in your head and then what your positioning would look like when the puck's in control. So how I, how I do it here, I, I've done one with uh, Carey Price too. I might have it on here, but it just yeah, shows I saw that. where you want to be. And then I show them an example of, okay, what do you see here? You see a guy coming in, you see Carey Price, you know, well above the top of the crease. You can see that this guy is not getting the puck. I mean, he's got three Canadians in between, but we'll see what happens, right? What do I have to worry about? I have to worry about the rebound. So then... Right. There goes carry around the other side again. So you start looking at, you see, there he is again, boom, way outside, slides over, nice and relaxed. There's the east-west, you see that? So when, when you start seeing how the east-west happens, he doesn't play as far out because he sees the player coming in and getting into that into that position. Right. So and that's, what, that's what the timing mechanisms look like. The blue line, you know, 
what where this line actually goes to the far post, the far post, and there's that triangle I talked about, right? And if you play inside this area right here, or you play in this area like Lundquist does, you're able to pivot and push into position where you can catch the Ovechkins and things like that. But if you play out here to try to catch Ovechkin, it's not happening. You're you're moving you're you're moving in on a shot and you're trying to catch it versus keeping everything in front of you. That makes sense. Sorry, Pascal, can you explain a little bit more of this timing here? Sorry, I'm sure. On the, the, on the rushes. The timing mechanisms are are here. So as they're coming down, are they coming mid lane or do they have a good chance of going into zone two or into zone one? So as they come in and go around this dot, you know they're entering this area here. They're going to enter into this soft ice here, and they're going to make a decision to either pass, okay, uh, the give and go here, or they're going to rim, or they're going to freeze the puck into the corner, depending on where the players' benches are. This is obviously where it is there. So the timing mechanism is just understanding as soon as that player crosses this blue line, the blue line's in front of them, now the blue line's behind them. That's a timing mechanism. You're pivoting, moving to position and deciding, do I have backside pressure or do I have a mid lane driver? And is my mid lane driver going to beat my puck carrier? Because if he does, he's going to go to the short side for the give and go. And I'm going to have to right. deal with either a, a screen or I'm going to have to deal with a below the goal line pass out. So it's, it's, it's knowing what, where the puck goes, it's knowing what you're going to expect next and prepare for it. Like, for example, I don't have to challenge on a shot from here if I've got a backdoor guy. I can stay right at the edge of my crease. And when that puck passes me, like it's going to miss me, I know it's going to this backdoor guy. So I put my stick on it and elevate it out of play. I disrupt the pass versus stopping the shot. And so guys that come out too far, they can't do that because as soon as they beat that player, it's the puck's already passed them. So you're, you're, you're learning to split the difference between uh, a pass disruption or shot stop, if that makes sense. Yep. When I get into block or action reaction, this is the shaded area for action reaction. You act, react, recover. These are where areas, this is a perfect area for your breakaways. They always make their fakes here. Or they make their fakes here. And then they, based on what you do, they, they move and, and, and take advantage of you. <clears throat> three quarter crease is a better a better control there now if i let's see if i go like this you can see the triangle you see that triangle um of of, of dark bold lines yeah so that triangle there without these things here this triangle right here allows you to pivot and get to those places you can get to the peak of the mountains a lot easier here you know than going way out here so that's just a shot line and that is the new shot line. There's the pass and there's the new shot line. So being able to get from here to here, from here is a lot easier than, than doing it from way out on top of the crease. So then we look at it, here's two grass. <clears throat> that was straight on, so. Um, but these are all tall orders because they happen like lightning fast. I'd rather show it in the Western Hockey League where we have time, but. The timing mechanisms in the action reaction recovery are here. Like it's this face off dot to the top of the circle, across the top of the circle, angling towards the center of the net. That area right there is all timing. So when you're when you're coming in and passing into here, you're you're going to be at um, at your three quarter crease max. When you get into block, which is this area, which I'll show you next. Well, let's take a look at the action reaction first. Oh no, this is block. So look at how Bobrovsky stays right there on the top of that triangle. So watch how gross this gets. See how he's just right on the post. He's in the middle. He's post. He's 50 crease. And that's it. So by having, you know, your positioning here and you're playing that, that same triangle that we talked about, you're playing post middle post and you're at 50% of your crease. You're not having to travel as much distance you're taking into consider puck proximity and you're able to get more of your mass. So they're forced to go around you. Um, when you say three, when you say three quarter pass, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I can't. Okay. I'm thinking right uh, that's, that's three quarter. quarter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, okay. That's yeah. For block. Exactly. Yeah. So that's up here, right? Three quarter crease okay. there, there, and there. And then those are the two posts. And then, right. you know, the last three, the 13 positions would be the post, the middle of the post. And when you say 13, like when we say 13 positions, it's really only changing here. You always go to your posts. 
So forget about the 13 positions. It's target your post. Top of the crease, three quarter crease, mid crease. You know, you're at 50 crease, 50 crease, 50 crease. And if you have to leak out to make certain saves, you can, but you don't want to get drawn too far out here. So the quick pass goes and you're, you're, you're out of commission. That's what Sorokin is, is uh, uh, Sorokin and uh, who's the goaltender for the Rangers. That's what he tends to do. He tends to close down on pucks and, and, and move out towards the puck. So now players are starting to hold on to it and pass it to the backside. And that's what Edmonton did really well. And then this is like, if you just watch Bobrovsky here, he makes the save and now he's, he's really super active, but he's just concentrating on sealing the ice and playing in that center spot there. He's really active, but if you watch the goalies now, they don't even move. They just sit there with their paddle down and let them hit, you know, hit the puck and hit the body. And then these are the timing mechanisms for block. So are they going to come up here and shoot? That's a VH. If they come down here and shoot, it's either um, a, a regular on post stop, or you can use a, you could use a VH, but I'd reserve it for dead angle. And then is the player coming down and coming up here? That's going to be an RVH. Are they coming here at the edge of the crease? I use these three timing mechanisms for recovery. So if you've made a save and the puck passes that line or passes that line or passes that line on your feet right away. When I shared this with Dave Alexander, I use these as marking points. So when you make a save, you want to be on your feet and ready by the time the puck ricochets to here, if that makes sense, to this line. He goes, yeah, it's a great idea, but I'm going to, by the time the season goes, I'm going to have Bennington and at that time, Jake Allen um, move their recovery to here so that they can make the save, get up on their feet or get into a, make sure they're in position by the time the puck reaches here. It's really hard to do, but it's a good goal to have. Right. So these are your rebound control areas. These are the attack areas from the sides of the net uh, below the goal line for RVH timing mechanisms. So okay. we'll watch this. So he uses a lot. Like that's why I chose quick on this one because he uses skate on post, toe box on post, pad and post, and a VH to so defend the net. Now he's below the goal line and he uses the VH on the left side, which is really scary, but for him, it's good, right? He likes it. That's what he wants to do. Let's see it again below the goal line. RVH paddle down. There's his hand down. Stop the puck because he knows that the percentages are low, just above the pad, things like that. If you look at him, look at him now. They gain possession, he's going to move into position. There's the block. Right. So, I mean, we can watch this one all day, but the, the main objective is, is that Quick, Quick's game is very much like our client, uh, Cal Peterson, just the opposite hand. When you start looking at how they play, they can play like that for a while, but as they get older, they're going to have to adjust their game to your point, which is economize your movements a little bit. Let's not be too erratic. Let's not to be too puck chasey. Um, you know, be patient. They're the ones that have to bring the game to you. And, and I think that, that that's where it goes into a lot of what you talk about. And then I had a, a clip here of Andrew Hammond. I'm not sure where it disappeared to, but when I was working with Andrew during his, um, his big run in Ottawa, when he went, uh, he, he got nominated for the Masterson um, trophy, he scanned constantly. And I think that that's one of the big things that has have kept him out of being in the National Hockey League as far as a, a, a more, a more uh, regular type of goaltender is watching and scanning. He was scanning often. So he always had that visual, you know, you go out, you grab the information, the picture gets lodged in your head as to what that looks like. Then you scan again when there's a, a battle on the wall. You scan again when it's a 50-50 puck. You scan again when the player turns his back on you. And you continue to Google search and pull those mental pictures back into your head so you know what hand they are, what position, where are they on the ice, so what zone are they in, and are they stationary or moving? So when I see goalies do it, they go, oh, what are you doing? And they go, vision check. I go, okay, what did you gather from your look? What do you mean? My goalie coach just told me to look, right. vision check. So I think you got to say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to know where is it, who's the next most dangerous player. I want you to know what zone and layer of depth he's in. And I want you to know what hand he is. And I want you to know whether he's stationary or moving because that's going to determine whether you slide or that's going to determine whether you use a lateral release. 
And it's, it's always just two decisions, except in that dead angle area where you're using three, the overlap, the, uh, the VH and the, and the RVH. And in, in general, to your point, which RVH are you going to use? Pad and post, skate on post, toe box on post, or toe bridge on post? Where is your hand going to be? Is it going to be up like this? Okay. Or is it going to be projected out? Is it going to be on the ice? So there's like, I've counted now 13 different ways to play an RVH um, using all of those different methods. And a lot of it is hand positioning and so forth. So um, it's just finding the right one for the situation where you can move the least, block the most, and have more confidence and more time for your brain to recognize what the game is presenting to your mind. And uh, you'll make better decisions that way. So question to ask you yeah. is um, we've got this diagram and I remember I, in one of the other presentations you were showing this. So this one, one of the things, yeah. And one of the things that I would say is we, we eventually want to get it to the point where now when we're playing, we're just letting our body do what it's been trained to do. So for me, we don't want to be thinking about all of this stuff while, while we're, while we're playing. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I, do. I, I don't want to have the, fl I don't want to have the flashlight on my head per se, right. thinking about, Oh, I got to be in this. I, I, so for me, my, my question I would want to ask you and, and for the audience, for the kids and, and even the pros, um, tough question to answer here, Pascal, but how would you, is it just doing enough of these scenarios? Like you said, where goalies in, in goalie practice are running enough of these, like they're getting all these routes thrown at them that eventually, they, oh, okay, they're, they're doing it they, where they learn. I guess that's the question I'm asking is these positional strategies, how do you teach it where it becomes more second nature, where they're, where they're not having to think about this. It's just their body's doing, yeah, I'm doing what Pasco's taught me. And it, that's a phenomenal question. And it, the way that I like to teach it is, is very simple. Like I'll, I, this, this video right here, um, I'll, I'll open it up. Uh, just right, shows so now you're probably we're not worried about what all my words mean on the ice. You see the I'll lines? To make a big, huge impact in your game on a regular basis. I'm here to tell you how that's going to happen, and we'll share what that information is going to be like in upcoming clips. Okay, so I would never, all right, um, so now you're I would never draw all of these lines out at the same time. So what I would do is I'd end up going into this, and I'd go, today we're going to work on zone entry. So when the player comes in, you're recognizing an odd man, an even man rush and looking at the sticks as far as strong hand to strong hand, strong hand to weak hand or one time or things like that. Once we've gone through that and they've made the save, where is the puck most likely to go? In the corners, right? So now from the corner, I'm going to teach um, what are they going to do here? So they go up to the point and the very next thing we're going to teach is screens right so you know that as soon as you make the save and that puck goes to a d you know that people are going to converge in front of you and you're going to have to fight for sight lines and you're going to have to use that that flashlight to find the puck and use your peripheral vision to identify the threats what stick where's Pavalski's stick at is he going to is he going to deflect the puck from the outside in and is it going to hit a stick and I got to watch right from release. Okay. So let's say that happens and the puck dribbles down here now, because I've made the save and the puck dribbled down below the goal line. The next thing I'm going to teach or draw out would just be this, this area right here, right? This area right here. And we'll be working on things below the goal line. So from behind the net, uh, passing out to here for the shot, passing out to here for the shot, working on just this area. And that's all I would draw out. So I'll draw this out first. Then the next time we get together, we're going to draw. Uh, we'll, uh, we can even erase these and just use the, the, the plays as far as the screens and deflections, backdoor plays, tips and deflection screens. Then we'll go into the next day. You'll come in and we'll draw zone one, right? And we'll, uh, we'll come in here and say, okay, today we're going to focus on this right here. And then in the afternoon, we're going to come back and we're not going to worry about this area. We're going to pass from here out there, right? right. 
So will the player pass out? Will they come up and shoot? Will they come up and, and skate a little further and shoot? So we'll run them through those scenarios and we'll, we'll label them all through. And also what plays a role is what hand are they? If he's a right-hander coming from this way, he's a lot more dangerous than a left-hander coming this way. So it's teaching them what to do in those particular scenarios. And then from there, I go into zone one. So, you know, having guys come down, skate and attacking zone one or net driving zone one. So they have a chance to use their, you know, their overlap. They can use their VH or RVH. They can come down in here and, and, and pick a puck out of the corner and come in and shoot. And then the next time we'd go out, we'd be working on something completely different. So we'd be working on zone two. And that's one of the, the zones that are probably one of the most dangerous because you got to recognize whether he's going to shoot the puck and then create a rebound, whether he's going to delay past high, middle, lower net front, or he's going to go give and go with that forward that beat him, things like that. So that's, I would teach it one step at a time all the way through so they can digest it. It's easy to understand. And then we would go to the next phase. And what that does for kids that are developing themselves for the Western Hockey League is that they're going to be able to mentally predict what's going to happen because at the Western Hockey League level, they're very, very good, not, not taking anything away from, them, but they're not National Hockey League players. So even the difference when I watch American League games and I watch an NHL game, there's a huge difference in, in positional responsibility and passing accuracy and playing together because players are going up and down all the time. So it's a, it's a big difference. But for goaltenders to be able to exercise this, that's how I would teach it, one phase at a time. I could do that in three days pretty easily. And, you know, they can have a book or a game plan book where they would just draw it out themselves. Very A chapter on depth management, a chapter on goalie IQ. What is the player most likely going to do in this situation when he gets the puck? And that's how I would teach it. And I'd limit it. Like everything on here is really only two two decisions but this has three because of uh it, it's one of those voluntary blind spots right you're turning your back away from the threat that's one of those moments where you're forced to look back here all of your defensemen are looking back here your forwards are looking back here because the puck's here and these defensemen are, or these players out here are trying to get in behind them right so that they can dart through Carrie Price, I guess somebody probably got a hold of one of these charts and went, oh, this is the RVH zone. It, it, you know, as soon as a player got down to here and touched the edge of that circle, Price would go down in an RVH. This winger, they started seeing that. And this winger saw that tendency, or sorry, the defenseman saw this tendency and would come racing down through here. So as soon as that player got here, he passed the puck right to that for a one-timer. And that was the end. Like Pr Price went, this is not working. They see it. Um, you know, and you could see he immediately made that change in his game, but you saw it over one or two games. He went, nah, I'm not doing this. He's going to hold his edges longer. He's not going to go into an RVH here. And that's why in my, in my revised charts, I, you know, this has to change a lot. Like this can't be an RVH zone. Um, this has to be something, you know, it could be one of three things, you know, but I would reserve the RVH for, you know, when they start coming up into this area, when they start going down and then taking that step to attack this way is what I would teach them. Can but you, every goal is different. Okay. Can you, um, you mentioned when it gets into zone two or zone three, there's only two decisions. Can you just touch upon that again a little bit more for me? Well, there's three in zone two. It's one of the most more complicated ones because when they come in, they're either going to, they're either going to come down here and they're going to shoot the puck. Now you can misplay it and get scored on, or it's very dangerous because the zone entry play uh, and the shot uh, is designed to disrupt uh, the defensive structure. So if you blast the puck as you come across this line, you make a save and the puck comes out here, your defensemen are looking at the puck, your forwards have now turned to look towards the puck, and now you've got all the attackers coming in on you. And that's what disrupts that. That turns into that Bobrovsky situation where everybody's now attacking the net and you have no idea where the shot's going to come from because the puck's moving all over the place. So you come in here and if they shoot the puck or they net drive that player and that puck are the number one priority for you. They've got no other help or anything, but when that player comes down and goes, ah, oh, the defenseman does a good job and turns away, you better scan because when he finishes his turn, he's going to look. And he's either going to bring that puck back up to the top and what's going to form What's going to form as soon as he passes the puck to the top? 
screens. So as soon as he turns and passes, he's gone, or he's going to play on the half wall while everybody else goes to the net front and tries to tip and screen. And, and we all know what that looks like. It's a disaster. In the NHL, they're so good at screening the puck and tipping the puck that goalies have to have. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's where I think the strobe glasses, the synaptic strobes, yeah. Um, because what it's doing is it's taking information away and then your brain has got to calculate it. And pro so whenever you get those screens where the guy shoots across his body, like you, you, you might be checking short side and then all of a sudden the guy shoots it far side yeah. and then your eyes and your brain got to pick it up quickly. Uh, that's where I've seen this. I agree. That's making, where I've seen the strobe between, glasses. making the links between the play and the strobe glasses is critical because then they see the why. I use a different terminology for that. I use um, uh, frames of, uh, of a film. So yep. maybe I see, you know, uh, a player at the top and then I see him pass the puck, but wait a minute, I blinked and missed a piece of that Frame. film. And yep. then two players screened it and then I saw it again and then another player screened it and then it finally shot. I have to fill those pieces, those film, that, that film, with my brain. My brain has to become the, the um, Academy Award winning editor of, of yep. linking everything together because I have to blink from time to time or the, I'm going to, even on the shot, when players blink, they lose eight, nine feet of the shot. So they have to really, like you look at Vasilevsky, I think he's probably got, you know, two invisible toothpicks in his eyes, <laughs> his eyes open, right? But you, you know, that's critical for his success, in my opinion, because the puck's coming at him 95, 100 miles an hour, and he doesn't want to miss a frame because that frame could be the difference between eight feet and making the right decision or guessing. And we want to take kind of that guesswork away if we can. Um, but th this is just the, the, the beginning stages of it. So once you, you know, once you, uh, the goaltender has that, then it starts to drill down where, you know, you, you start asking the player is behind the goal, below the goal line. He passed it out net front. Are you going to challenge that guy? Okay. Where did the puck originate from? <laughs> Cause where's that guy going? Right. Is you, you're playing a pass, like one pass out to me and then I shoot the puck, but that guy's there for the rebound. He's there for a give and go. So, you know, he's there to screen. So you, you got to remember where that pass is coming from. And that's going to determine your depth, which also determines you split the difference. Are you going to catch it a little wider? Are you going to have to be able to be a little bit mobile? Are you going to turn it into a block situation because of puck proximity? These things all start to come. But I think that if you throw it all at them at the same time, especially NHL guys, they'll go, forget it. I'm just going to play the game. I don't want to listen to this stuff. And, and that's, that was, that's what will happen. You hear, when I was in Dallas Stars uh, development camp in 2013, the goaltenders were asked, do you, you know, do you, do you use a mental training coach? Because no, there's too many lists to memorize and too many of this to memorize. And, you know, I just like to um, listen to this kind of music or I like to um, not think and clear my mind. And it's funny, I, I kind of chuckled to myself. I go, well, well, that's what the mental training coach teaches you to do is to gain mental clarity to exercise those muscles to block other things out that are unnecessary and to gain access to critical decision making pieces for you to to process the game at the top speed and uh you know i'm not going to force it on them but i am definitely going to find a way to to massage that into a goaltender's game a little bit at a time because he's told me how he or she feels about that so now i gotta i gotta i gotta respect that and i've got to learn a really good creative way to say, I have a way for you to gain access. Maybe it's not going to be during the season. Uh, maybe I won't have permission to make those changes from that athlete. Um, but at a young athlete, I explain what is it? When do you use it? Why does it work? When should it be executed? And who's got the answers to that to help you? Um, because I don't want a goalie. I don't want to be a goalie coach that says, do this. And the goalie goes, well, why? He goes, just do it. And he has success, but when he goes in a game, guess who's not on the ice being his conscience, right? right? You, you're not, and neither am I. So are you, you open, are you open to this? Are you open to this, Pasco? Like for me, the other thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that guys could do to really learn this where they're, they're not thinking about it would be to do game film and, and, and going on watching, you know, like watching NHL goalies and, and, studying them and then and then for me a lot of it when I get kids to do game film I will I get them to imagine themselves and doing that like um would that that's one like so for me like 
Would that make sense? About Absolutely. So in your, to... in your situation, you'd be like, okay, today we're going to like, this is perfect because you are a goalie coach and you're also uh, you're like a mental training consultant. You're, you're, you know, you, you're who you are. So it'd be like, today we're going to work on, um, we're going to track your scoring situations. So um, let's track your scoring situations. What, how many clear shots did you have? How many breakaways did you have? We'll give them a little, a little simple uh, thing I created on numbers. And then the parents can add what situations they were or whatever, or they can film it and the kid can do it afterwards to teach them to learn, to recognize it. I like the backup goaltender to, to do it for the goalie that's playing and vice versa because it teaches yep. them to stay in the game and to recognize that stuff. And when they get scored on, then you're able to see percentages. So uh, for example, last night I sent these to our UB, UBC athletes. Um, let's see here, right here. Oh, did it disappear? Uh, we'll go, let's see this. Go out here, go here. Do you see this? Okay, yep. So there's the scoring situations that we're tracking. So on entries, they had 12 no goals against screens, 10, no goals against tips and deflections, one and one. So do you think tips and deflections are a priority for us? Yes. Right. You start looking at all of these different things, eight, no, four, no, you start realizing that, okay, tips and deflections become really important with Elise. Um, what about the other goaltender, you know, and then you're able to do it with this one, which is Reese. And then you'll, you'll she's allowed a few more goals, but you start looking at, um, 9090 three and one tips and deflections. So I've got two goaltenders that need to work on that. And then you look at seven and one east west plays rebounds. Do you think that that's a priority when you have three shots and you have two goals against? Yeah. So that shapes what we do. So going back to your, um, awesome. your, your point was, okay, let's go. You know, you'll be like, okay, today's uh, focus is going to be on tips and deflections. So we go in here and we go to, um, uh, tips and deflections. And then we just, we start going through, I got a whole bunch of them on my, um, uh, uh, on my drive here. So I would just go to tips and deflections There's 15 of them. Um, and then we'd look through them, understand what we're trying to look for. And then we go to back to their film and go, what did you see here? Cause I wasn't on the ice. I want to know what you saw. Oh, it hit that shin pad and that, and that, uh, lace. And then it went in the net. Okay. Um, so how, would the how uh, how now that you we've gone through that process how is that going to change how you approach practice today and then i communicate with the coaches can we have a drill on tips and deflections and then we'd uh, we go through that process because they'd already know we have a problem with tips and deflections because i told them already right are, are you open to this pasco like i don't know how how, how you are you're doing for time here um there is a game uh, between carolina and um tampa and yeah. wanted to ask your opinion on the second goal that beat Freddie and wanted to ask your opinion on the overtime goal that beat uh, Skoleski. I'd love to just, and, and if again, using, using these zones, if to, you don't mind doing that to help me to how you would, you know, again, I love that. I love all these, that breakdown of, of how the goals. So the two, one game. Yep. Okay. Uh, are you okay doing this? Is that okay? Yeah, why not? Totally fine. Uh, November the 9th, I'm assuming, right? Yep. Okay. Today, you're about to become richer than you ever imagined. Oh, thanks. I'm talking big money. <laughs> John, we're lucky. So where is it? Uh, was it later in the game? Uh, second, the second goal... I think it's second period. Yeah, it's it's definitely the second period. What happens is he, okay, so, he comes up. Um, yeah, so right there, you look at like when you're teaching scoring, like, like what's the tendency here? The goalie's down. Is he going to get up and T-push? <laughs> He's going to slide. Where do we put the puck? Right along the ice. <laughs> like we'll see it from this angle. Right, there it is. Oh, okay, I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot low. Why not shoot high <laughs> in that scenario? Yeah, let's see what happens here. Oh, 
Yeah, I've never seen that. <laughs> that was crazy. His, awesome. his blade blasted right out. But here's here, here's the guy around the circle. He's a left hand. Okay, why is he in an R- so yeah. why is he in an RVH right now? Like I, I don't even know what happened yet, but wh- watch. So now he's in an RVH. He's got four Carolina Hurricanes like this, and he's got one uh, Tampa Bay guy. Why is he in an RV? There's no threat, and then you've you've. It's like you getting into a butterfly and sitting in a butterfly, right? But anyway, so now he got up for no reason, and now look at the backside play here. Right. Yes. So let's see if he scans. No, he's caught way out here. That was a challenge. Now you can blame the goaltender on that one, or you can blame the D coverage. And that would be blaming D coverage in that scenario. You got, you got puck watchers here, right? So I guess what I would ask here, Pasco is. Yep. Just so again, so I, I, because I, I, again, I love this battlefield. So in this, this scenario, um, if you're working with say even Freddie here, how, or, or how would you work? For me, again, even more importantly, you work the zones here. So again, like he's he's going from zone one into zone two, and like you said to me, like when I saw this, um, because there's that guy's back door and he's in a one T position. Yeah. He one he's got to re- he's got to recognize that guy's there, mm-hmm. but then to me, he would be at that maybe three quarter position. Um, because then, you know, because Freddie's a big guy, he's six foot four. So yeah. um, when he put himself in a good position, if he was at the three quarter position to, to make that save, but he'd also, I, he, he put himself in a good position that if he did put it back door, he could get, he could get to that back door option. Would, right. Like, but I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, this is how I would have taught it before I would have d- known your zones. And, mm-hmm. I, and that's what I'm trying to see is how, how you would use the zones and the, okay. and the, uh, so, and uh, let's go. So where did they come from? They came from below the goal line and they were in control, right? So that would be, he doesn't have to come off that post at all. Even in some cases, you don't even have to come off the post till it touches the blue line, but going into an RVH was a mistake. Then he cut in past this line right here, which is the entrance way to zone two what layer of depth because he's in zone three right now zone two would be further over but now layers of depth become more important so he's gone from control to action reaction right so that would be the that would be the adjustment that you're looking at right let's see if we can see it from another position here so there you go so here comes the rvh good now he's in control now he's in action reaction so he's, he's there, but see how, what happens? He gets super wide. When you get wide like that, in, in my opinion, you could tell me how you feel about it. When you're wide, you can't move laterally. Like it's like, if you're really wide, you have to literally move away to replant your foot so you can move. So his, his feet needed to be a little bit closer together and he needed to be a little bit further back. That being said, you- again, his number one priority is that shooter. We don't need three, four players on that guy. We need someone on this guy. And that's Stamkos. So we can't, like, you can't just leave that guy there. So I'd have a discussion with the coach and go, hey, I understand he, Freddie let the goal in here, but let's, you know, who, who has this guy? You know, he's, he's one of the most prolific penalty, uh, you know, penalty players on the ice. And he's also one of the best goal scorers in the NHL. Why are we leaving him? He has no chance because he's rooted. His feet are so wide and he's way at the top of his crease. So I would, t- I would talk to him and go, okay, well, what would you rather do? He says, well, I want the shooter. Okay, so we have to communicate to our D and we should have communicated to our D back here. Sorry. Now, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him, right? So that guy would need to stay with him. He let him go. Yeah. So that I bet you the conversation in the room wasn't about Freddie. It was about it was about someone left Stamkos open, in my opinion. But yes, you'd be right saying three quarter crease, 
split the difference and honor the shot. If, if it goes back door, then he has a better chance of getting apex to apex or top of the mountain to top of the mountain to stop the puck. Because what, what I had always taught, like I said, before I got introduced is I had learned this a long time ago from my goalie coach, whenever the puck is on the outside thirds of the ice, whether you do it with your eyes or whether you do it with your head, you're aware of where the open men are and which way their blades are on the other two thirds of the ice. That's what right. I was taught right. a, a long time ago. And like you said, like when that guy was coming up, whether, you know, and again, like, this is why I, I like Josh Tucker stuff, because now if I'm doing these exercises where I don't even, I don't like, again, I don't even have to turn my head with my eyes. I'm aware. Oh, the stamp coast is there. Like yeah. I, I, I know, you know, and then when you get into the, the, the neuro tracker and some of the other exercises, my memory, like, cause you're, you're working, you're not just your, your, your ability to focus, but your other cognitive capacities, like your working memory. Oh, mm -hmm. I re like I said, what, like you mentioned earlier, if the pass goes from behind the goal line up, up, well, you also remember this guy can come above the goal line and be a backdoor option. Right. And so you're. It's, it's a, it's a moving puzzle for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you so look the, at, what I wanted to ask you, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So what I'm also going to stay here real quick is, is this part here. So he, here comes the player now, pops out. So what hand is Stamkos, which plays a big role here too, yeah. right? So Stamkos has got an inside shot, meaning his, pot, his stick is going to be on the inside rink, not on the outside rink. So that would determine what is what uh, your response is going to be. Are you going to target the post? Because if Stamkos was left-handed, um, targeting the post, he'd have no goal. Right. But when you have a player that's here with a one timer, now you got to focus on moving into three quarter crease here or 50 crease here, uh, whatever you can manage. So you'd be going from three quarter to half crease. Yeah. And you can't. And he's caught so far in that. But, you know, again, I, like I said, I, I would I would not really blame Freddie on that. I would I would be talking about we missed an assignment. Like he did what he did, but the, the other, he says, if you, if you could do something, what would it be? It would be like moving into that position. But Freddie might just say, Hey, he's in a, he's in a critical piece right there. I don't, I don't want to play deeper because he's going to beat me. And then I'm really going to get blamed for the goal. So he took like, he has no reason not to challenge other than Stamkos. And to me, that's a missed assignment, but that's the danger of the puck coming out of the corner is we have a lot of watchers, but look at these guys. Uh, my little saying is the man with the least amount of eyes on him scores the most goals. And what do you have here? Yeah. Nobody's looking at him. And that's why, you know, these guys are so good. You know, unless you're Connor, <laughs> Connor David, everybody's yeah. eyes on him, he still scores. And what was, you, you, what was the thing you wanted to go with? Did you want yeah, to go if you go right to the end, okay. very, 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 very end, um, this is the, you're going to see the uh, overtime goal. There was two actually overtime goals. The first one got got disallowed. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Perfect time for this guy to teach me how to get rich on the internet. Okay, here we go. Great. So we'll have to see it from another aspect. Because the commentator says the the goalie wasn't set. No, he was set, but. Oh no, he was set. He just handcuffed him. Yeah. Now it did go off. It did go, it did go off. A Hedberg stick. Yeah. So that's that's pre-save movement, right? So he saw he saw that, reacted to it. So there was a reaction, and then all of a sudden he had to go back the other way. That's just pre-save movement. Yeah. Now correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah. If I if if I do that behind the net camera angle again, this this yep. comes into the um, to me the X tracker, you know, um, or live trajectory, whoever wants to. Like yep. to me, if if I'm and I'm being I'm being nitpicky here, like if if we pause it before it's released, what I get to me if I'm drawing those laser beams from the middle of his, you know, eye sockets. It tells me it, what I kind of look. Would you say his head is on 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 it, or is it? It looks maybe a little bit above 
the puck. Like yeah. When I I go, so. Whenever I puck. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's kind of in that Vasilevsky likes to play tall. And if you notice the majority of his yeah. movement prior to that was a lot of shuffling out in this area. So again, that's yeah. a lot of work. So if you look at say uh, a line that goes from there to the middle of the cre or middle of the goal line um, yeah. out that way, right. That's a lot of space to go. Had he even just played in here, he would have probably been a yeah. shuffle and a shuffle, but count how many shuffles like he does here it's it's pretty pretty amazing so one two three four five six six shuffles i'm not sure he needs six shuffles i'm pretty sure he could have done a shuffle there and a little maybe a shuffle there and he would have been done or maybe three at the most and he would have been at three quarter crease and, and probably would have had a better uh, opportunity at it uh he's playing top of crease while they're in action reaction too so if you make one little mistake and you're not quite in that shot line, like in this case, it, all it was was him moving out of the way of the shot. And that was because it got deflected. Right. So there's a screen and then boom. <clears throat> so in my opinion, if he, if I think he could have played a little deeper on this one um okay. and he would have got it if he was a little bit a little bit lower in his stance he probably would have been in a better position too but that's that's really stretching it so if you don't mind me asking where yeah. where in your opinion when we talk about the x tracker or the strobes or um you know the clock to percent how do you see it you know like again for me i i one of the reasons why I like the rebounder boards, I'm not a big fan of goalies just throwing a ball against the wall because that's not simulating the trajectory that they're going to face. I'd rather have guys do it where they are actually getting the, the puck coming from ice ice level upward on them. And yeah. um, that's one of the reasons why, um, if you don't mind me asking, in, in your opinion, where, <clears throat> how do you see the, and I, I'm not a big fan of the word vision training. Um, yeah. I, th I, I call it cognitive perceptual. I, I wish goalies coaches would stop calling it hand eye because it's eye hand. It's the, yeah. they're, they're getting that information from the visual, but I, I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, how do you see the, the cognitive perceptual, like these, the, the, the fit lights and all this different stuff factoring in to the, to the equation? Well, I, for me, I think that they all fit in because the, you know, when you're dealing with strobes, uh, strobe glasses, or you're dealing with different things like that. It's showing you that your eyes are going to be disrupted in some way, shape, and form, and you've got to be comfortable with that. When you tend not to see something, the first feeling that a goalie gets is panic. That's the first feeling. Where, oh, where is it? And that panic, if you if you think of the mind, in my opinion, if you think of the mind as 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 four pucks. The moment that puck disappears and that panic steps in, it's like taking one of those pucks and giving it 25% um, basically of your focus is now gone to that screen. So now your save your opportunity to stop the puck is now 750. Now it deflected. Well, that's another 25% of your mind. Oh, geez, it, it deflected. Now I have to react. Now you've only got a 500, you know, 50% chance of stopping the puck. So I think that those neuro trainers and and like i i have a product now uh that uh, i've gotten from mendy i've got two mendy's that are that basically just focus on uh, the uh the focus on a dot that continues to build and and it, it creates a score for you and you get stronger and stronger and there's a lot of clinics or not clinics but like coffee shop type organizations where you pay a drop in and you go in and, and work on your neuro tracker in, in places like sweden and stuff like that but um, or I should say your Mendy tracker. So I think that there's a huge example. I th just think it needs to be paralleled. It needs to be joined, joined. Hey, in this situation where there's quick decisions or you're, there's a disruption or there's a, a requirement for you to recognize a quick change, um, you know, anything to do with uh, pushing your mind to get stronger, pushing your eyes to get stronger in recognition and linking that to your response um you know and and really managing your fight to uh, your fight and flight situation you know again back to breathing patterns and things like that exhaling when you when you butterfly brings you faster to the ice and you know any we look at these teams spend millions and millions of dollars on things every year team canada spends millions of dollars trying to get their teams to win olympic gold you know 
it's because we're looking for the edge. And if you're, if you're taking away the most important piece, which arguably is tracking a puck that's no bigger than the top of this pencil or this pen, you know, from the blue line, and then the maximum it's going to get is probably, you know, not even the same size as this pen. It's a lot to ask. So why disrupt it with poor masks? Why disrupt it with lack of training? You need to train your eyes as you start to go through that. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, yeah, I, I and, 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 and you agree with that? No, I do. And and the only thing, like I said, I, I've always used the meta for Pasco that, you know, somebody, a parent came in to our training facility and they said, okay, um, you know, and I'll say, look, you know, if you're doing um, leg strength drills or if you're yeah. doing quick feet ladder drills, is that going to make you a better goalie? Yeah. And, and my answer is yes and no. Right. And I get kind of like, you know, weird look. And it's like, well, if I, if my feet are really, really like there was a goal, the second goal that beat Braden the other night, the other night um, against uh, Winnipeg pass comes from behind the goal line out to the top of the circle um, and Braden. And I mean, even right now he's still lightning quick, like absolutely like given his age, he's lightning quick. But the problem was when he got beat backside from where he came from, and what he did is he pushed to the body instead of to the blade. And he pushed, again, one of the things, if, I, if he would have taken that quick look, really known where to push to, he gained depth before he gained setter. Mm -hmm. And that is, so that's, again, to me, and he didn't set his feet. Like he was still moving when the puck was released. Yeah. But so that for me, it's like the neuro tracker, it's going to help identify where guys are. Yeah, but it's it's those principles, those guidelines. You also need to, you you, I think, your battlefield is amazing because then what you're doing is you're it's processing information, and you right. and because you know how to, you you've worked on it. These your eye skills are just going to allow you to see more, process it faster. But if you don't know what you're processing, then it's not it's right. not gonna. Make, right. Like I've seen guys, and, and there is a fair comment that. Um, if you're, you're doing all this stuff, you may still not make saves. And it's because, yeah, you have to, again, your, your term goalie sense hockey IQ, you have to have an understanding. Like, again, I, I've seen guys that are very good, but if they're really late getting set up on the play, that's not going to help either. So I, to me, it's a blending. You, you got to sit with your goalie coach, go through like, like things, you know, like exactly what you showed and you're still strengthening those your eye skills to allow you to apply it to this that that's that would be my argument yeah it's like if 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 we were working on uh like let's say that you and i were working together i referred you uh, an athlete what i'd be doing is saying okay go see john stevenson let's talk about stuff and then you know you're going to talk about the the and putting together a mental training plan and then you're also going to be uh, focusing on on uh you know working with the eyes and, and recognition i'd be talking about this stuff so I'd be like, okay, so what we're going to do is this is why uh, you're working with, with John in this scenario. So, so for example, let me just uh, find, a, find a good uh, example of this here. I think I've got it on here. Is it going IQ? I think I put it in here. I, think I, thought, I thought I had two of them, but maybe not. Goalie IQ. Let's see here. I want the video. There it is. So on this one here, I'd be like, okay, there's the puck. But as they were going into zone entry, you needed to recognize like these these two guys and whether they were neutralized and what hands they were. They're both open for one timers, right? So right. you know that guy's got him. You know this guy's got him. So now the you know through the process of elimination. We're focusing on the puck. Now, are you square to the puck? <laughs> no, you're not. That's why you get beat on this play. So we start we start focusing on like little things like like that. Like once they understand what they're looking for, like you know, I, I do this a lot faster in the presentation. It's bang, 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 and then shot. Like these these are the ways to improve the speed of the processor and and, and come down to the process of elimination. 
and just showing them, okay, you're, you've, your eyes have eliminated those because you recognize that, you know, based on the body position, he's not feeding the open guy. That pass is probably not getting through. He's going to shoot the puck. And so he shoots the puck. So the, I, I agree that you can link all of these. There's no, no question that you can, you can link them. And it's the same thing when I'm, you know, when you, we start to talk about like where we're taking them, um, what lists we go down in situations. And that way they can focus on where they're going. You know? From depth. So when you're talking about going into zone two, then he moves into that position. The triangle still exists, but you're starting to focus a little bit more on left side or right side. And you're placing pucks into the boards with your pad. So, you know, this is just talking about, okay, on the recognition, on the release, did you recognize it going to the left? Did you recognize it going to the right or going dead center? And then what skill you're using? So I talked to goaltenders about using their right pad here because it forces the puck down low in a flat position. So your D-man can pick it up and get it out of the zone. If you use your stick, it, it may go back there. It'll definitely bounce off the boards and create some turbulence, or it'll skip back here and go to the exact opposite side of the ice where you're not and neither are any of your teammates. So now you've got this giant, this chaos that's happening yeah. in your defensive zone. So I teach it like that as well. Oh, elevating. You, can see you know, so the these are the things you're, you're looking for when you're talking about your eyes. This, this one here, the one you just showed, is that on a video presentation? No, I've, or, I've, I I've uh, it's not, but I can send it to you. That's, that's, you know, knowing your battlefield. That'd be, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Someone's calling for help, John. Just give me a sec. Sorry about that, John. Oh, no worries. Sorry. I got to head down there. I, my, okay. mom lives, my mom lives with us, so she feels a little bit uh, sick. So they thought something bad was happening, but I checked her and she seems to be not too bad, just feeling dizzy. So I'll have to leave pretty soon, but we can definitely yeah. go back to this. And if you want, I can, I can send you this presentation as well. That'd be fantastic. Uh, yeah. And then you can look through it. And then if you have questions, we can always meet up again. <laughs> See, like, like your zones, just to finish off, like the yeah. zones where I think I could, like, again, like, obviously, one, I want to send kids to you, but the other part of it is, okay, mental rehearsal. Now I'm running, I'm running different images, different scenarios in these different zones. So like, not just doing physical reps, but now I'm also doing the, the, the mental reps. Like, yeah. um, does that, that make sense? Like, to, yeah, like where you I'm, can you can say to your clients too, is that once you've gone through it, you've say you've, you've done the first part of it with, with exercising the eyes, the second part of it with looking at some video, the third part of it is do mental visualization. 
So you could yeah. say, I want you to visualize um, the same scenario five times of below the goal line attacks into this blue paint for a quick stuff. And you're going to come on your left side. So you see the good player coming down and you stop and go, what hand was the player that you visualized? Oh, he's left-handed. Very good. What color was his jersey? Blue. Okay, that's great. So now when he crosses over the trapezoid, you know, what, what position, what position are you going to be in and so forth? So that when they when they do this, they can viv vividly visualize and they never visualize negativity or or mistakes. They only dream right. about the mistakes. They they visualize complete control. And that's where they can work on their timing because we brought forward that, okay, the timing mechanism is the decision-making line and uh, the goal line, which are all in existence on the ice. Zones are great, but layers of depth tell a big story. Um, you know, like this is just a shot line. So when you shoot on a, on a goaltender, talk about impact zones, but when you watch these kids catch, like these are just young kids. So watch how they track, right? You see that? So now I'll shoot some pucks on these guys and, and you just watch. Like, so teaching them to move without having to preload, right? They're only, these, they're only like 12 years old. Like you see how fast they work, right? You know, moving to the right, moving to the left, stop, block, or save. So these types of things just allow goaltenders to become quicker and quicker. But, but if you look at the beginning, what was it? This was, this was you. Right. If you stand in certain spots, right. So we start talking about what does it look like? What are you, what are you seeing? That's why I did the tracking piece. I talked about the challenges at the beginning. He's a very large glove. Okay. So to, um, uh, this is just a zoom call that I did for clients, but you know, talking about yeah. over rotating and, you know, talking about the, what the, what the little mistakes are at the beginning and then having the ability to track down and, and, and disrupt, uh, disrupt puck patterns. And then there's the travel of the puck. So when you do that, you can have this goaltender over here, visualizing that exact same move, diagonally leaning, keeping your glove forward, receiving the puck. Like these are all things that are, are critical. And, uh, and then you can start getting into the shooting, you know, once you've gone through all this stuff, but all that stuff could take place in the classroom or in your office first and then we get into this stuff okay well thank you for are do you, you are you just out of curiosity are you using the x tracker yourself the x tracker is something that uh that dave alexander and, and mike valley put together um yeah. i've used the x tracker a few times um only when i can't get the point across and i have to talk way too much what I find that that's good about the X tracker, first of all, it works better with NHL masks than it does with regular cages because it just slides up and down the cage. It doesn't have the cat eye or the HM30 fit that the X tracker is really made for. And it blocks the lower portion. So it just gets the goalies to tilt their head down. So instead of me yelling, uh, you know, look at the puck, you don't have to respect me, respect the puck. Like, you know, um, you bend your legs, Basically, what the X tracker does is that in order for them to see the puck, they have to do those things. So I don't have to repeat myself. So it's kind of self preservation. Uh, so there's a good thing and a bad thing to it. Number one, they won't know because I haven't talked to them. <laughs> so I usually talk to them first, put the X tracker on for five or six minutes, take it off, and then go and then go with it because I think they just need to see what they don't see. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, it, it's just for me, it's a it's another tool, just like I use anchor pegs or you know four by four pieces of wood or like it, any prop like look at mitch corn he's got every prop under the sun you know some people may think some of it's silly hey it it hits 20 percent of his group the right way and then another prop hits the other 20 percent another prop hits another 20 percent until 100 percent of his group is impacted you know clearly what he does is important and it's good because everywhere he goes he seems to have success so yeah. I look at Mitch Korn as a kind of an innovator in such a way that he, if he finds one kid that doesn't understand fully and get a clear picture in his mind of what he's trying to say, he'll come up with some sort of a, a different way to explain it. You know, whether it's a prop or verbiage or whether it's asking another person, he doesn't care. I don't think, I think he just, you know, you know what I mean by he doesn't care. He doesn't, he's not afraid to investigate and find. And that, and that's uh, what keeps, I think him so relevant, you know, 
is he's continuing learning and learning and trying to find new ways to do it. Very similar to what you and I are doing right now. Yeah. Trying to find different ways to explain it and how we can work together to help goalies because ultimately we fade into the darkness, right? <laughs> we fade into the darkness. It's their success. Uh, we're just there to help facilitate in any way that we can and then just quietly disappear in the blackness because let's face it, mental training coaches, goalie coaches, you know, skills coaches, if there's a totem pole, not to, you know, for the lack of better terms, you know, we're usually part of, a, part of us are in the dirt <laughs> that are holding the pole up. Everything else is above getting all the glory, right, with the head coach and the GM at the top. So, you know, we know our places and we're not going to, you know, we know how important it is. It's just whether it's um, respected well enough to stay long term or get fired, <laughs> really. You know, as long well, as again, the again, do well and they, they do well, right? I can't thank you do enough doing this um the um yeah if if the um if again we're i, I get with the battlefield that picture um because obviously i know you you did a book um the the um with regards to how we can get kids this information um and, and i like i like what you talked about too just the um uh, yeah things like like you're showing here the the yeah. the other um sorry i'm having a brain fart here um with regards to um how we can get kids how we can work together in some way shape or form to make sure the kids are getting all the information <laughs> the best we can right yeah and it <clears throat> for for me it's the uh, you know when i saw this about it just made so much sense to me. And again, um, <clears throat> like, you know, how you said you had that chart about these are the different ways that they got beat. And then when they're going to go, because I'm a big fan, I want kids to go back and do their own game film. It's like David Goggins talks a lot about the autopsy, the active, um, the active report. Yeah. So now when they're yeah. going back, the, the famous question that was always taught me is if I had a chance knowing what I know now, what would I do differently to come up with the safe? And, mm. and so now that's, I'm oh like in that one that we did with Freddie. Okay. It's, um, I, that's a tough play, but maybe he would look okay, if, Oh, I got to do a better job identifying that backdoor option. Mm. Oh, if I had a chance to do it again, I might be a little bit more conservative with my depth. Right. Um, and then now I'm running through in my mind, you know, like you talked about earlier, I, did I have to go down an RVH there? No, I could have been up on my feet. So now I'm, I'm replaying that in my mind and seeing myself doing it differently. And that's, that's where the mental rehearsal piece would, would come in. But right. that chart that you had about, um, about all the different goals that like, if somehow, some way, I don't want to like, if, if I, if kids have to pay for it and, and I want, you know, like any of that, that type of stuff where I can direct them to, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, sure. that, well, that's I'll, a great way. I'll get a chance Breaking to digest this. I'll have a, di a chance to digest this conversation today and then we'll figure out a, the best way to do it. Maybe we should follow up sometime late next week and kind of go, okay, this is what I got from it. This is what you got from it. And this is how we should proceed. And it just helps, it'll help people get, gain more access to it because if we have to wait for, um, for organizations to do it, we might be waiting a long time and maybe somebody would replace us a long time ago. Um, but it's the main objective is how do we get it into the hands of, uh, of the players now so that they can kind of recognize it and learn why they're doing what they're doing and how it's gonna make a big impact on their game. Um, because it's it's so valuable, it's so valuable. You yeah, know? no, and, and, and you're, you're, other than honestly, Pasco, I say this, like what you just showed me today in your videos, uh, there's another guy, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called Map Goaltending, M-A-M-A-P. Yeah, uh, it's on YouTube. He does NHL game breakdowns. Yeah, I don't know who this per person is. Yeah, um, but I think he, I honestly, I, he does. I think he does a pretty good job of breaking the guys down. He does a really, um, really good job, and and that's one of the exercises we, you know, that that I do with certain guys that want mentorship. So they're goalie coaches, and I'll say, okay, great. I want you to break down the game uh, and, and find the tendencies of jean sebastian Jaguar or whoever and then how would you yeah. how would you beat them and then how would you make the correction so you're seeing all sides of the game and that's a great exercise and and yes matt that that gentleman that does that does a great job at breaking it down he's very accurate uses excellent verbiage and 
it's easy to understand. So that's another place where kids can target and learn a little bit more about it. Again, yeah, it, I've it, been direct, and I've been directing yeah. kids to that, like yeah. to your, to yours, to his. Yeah. Um, like, cause you, there's not the, the first guy that I ever got introduced to this was Pete. And then I don't know if you ever saw this video, uh, Pasco, uh, Joe Bertania, um, hmm. Joe Bertania, he used to be the goalie coach for the Boston Bruins. Yeah. And he, um, he had a video on, on this um, where it, unfortunately, it, I don't know, it, it just, it got lost. It's, that was the very first video that I ever learned about teaching, teaching, not about saves, skating, any of that. It was all about teaching kids. You know, if the open man has a better shooting angle than the guy with the puck carrier, well, then what can you start to anticipate? Right. No one had ever talked about any of this stuff. Joe did a phenomenal job. Um, and I asked him, he said, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't get it converted over into, uh, like it was done way back in VHS. And I said, yeah. like, is there any way do you have this? He said, no, unfortunately. And I, I'm not sure what would ever happen to Joe, but he was, um, big NCAA division one guy for years, almost similar to Mitch. And yeah. it was a goalie coach for the Bruins for a while. Um, but he was the first guy that ever did a really good job of breaking it down that way. Yeah. And I think. <laughs> most of the kids that I know they've like, like you even said with, how do you get a, a goalie like Jimmy Howard who never, like you said, never even heard of this stuff mm. until he got to the NHL level. Oh yeah. You know, it's this, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. And I, like I said to you before, it's the, the main thing is that like you have guys like Joe, I haven't seen that video, but I'm sure it's phenomenal. It's a very thankless job. And it's also a lot of the bulk of the work. Because when do these kids learn how to how to really, really understand the game, not just play it? Like, if I tell you to go stand over here and you're going to be kind of the anchor on the power play, your job is really, I'm going to pass the puck, I'm going to pass the puck. But do you ever talk about what you're trying to do to the box or the triangle inside? Like, what is the purpose of you passing the puck? And what are you trying to do to the defenders? You're trying to make them... Uh, change direction in a direction that you want to open up for yourself so these things aren't explained they just like go do this <laughs> it's just like saying let's go do this St. Louis drill I saw the Canucks do it well yeah that's great but how many skills are locked into that whole process and what are you trying to do and is there a cherry a, a changing of speed and you know do you recognize the fact that when you're carrying the puck you're 20 percent slower than you are when you're not carrying the puck and how does that play a role like all these little things but you're you're right like Goalie IQ, goalie sense, hockey IQ, it's just not taught. Um, and it's a great way to, it's a great way to learn uh, the game. And, uh, and that's truly how you, that's why these great minds in hockey, they understand uh, what the game is all about and what you're trying to do. We're still trying to teach it at the university level too, like goalie IQ, hockey IQ. And it's, uh, uh, it's tough because they've, they've missed so many years. They just know how to play the game. They just don't understand that there's varying varying ways to play it you don't have to play at one speed you don't have to if you have a fast team you can make them skate a lot more before you start changing your game and you know think about um what's his name there uh cavillo cavillo alvarez the boxer who just unified four belts he had a game plan for six seven eight rounds he allowed the guy to come forward and throw some punches until he understood what his game plan was and then he executed the game plan that was appropriate at the time and he stuck to it like glue and um well that's how you unify you know the the crowns that's how you win hockey games is that you you lull your opponent into a position they don't want to get into and then all of a sudden they hammer you with their game plan and, and that really what it what it's about you know i think um brian burke said it uh in order for you to win the stanley cup you need four teams um within one team and you go you need a team that can be very very physical and then you need, you're going to, the next round you play, you need a team that can be very, that can defend against someone that's very, very fast. And then the next round, you're going to play against a, a highly skilled team. So maybe you're going to play against Ovechkin and uh, that team. And then the last one is you're going to get a combination of all four. And that's the Stanley Cup final. So you, your team has to be able to be flexible in those areas while still maintaining their game plan without, you can't change your whole team every, every round. You have to you know, play into the opponent's strengths in certain ways. And then, you know, you get to a point where you can execute your game plan. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Right well, well, let's, again, let's get you, together again. You give me a lot of time. You give me a lot of time. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. And I'll send okay, this thank you and the, and the video off to you as well.
and honestly, like I said, if there's anything I can do, if you, um, you know, like we've got all these different things that we do in the back gym, we have this 1500 square foot gym now where we're doing um, not just using technology, but we're also doing things where um, I don't, I don't know if you've seen it, Pasco, there's a guy named the, uh, he's got these eye hand charts where you can do it anywhere, anytime, any place. Oh, really? Um, his name's Jacob. Yeah. Jacob was on Instagram. It's, I think he's called the hand eye body coach. Um, I can send you like, it's good. It's really, really good. Yeah, and, and once, sure. yeah, it's, um, again, the thing that I love about it is, um, you can, um, it's free. Um, the other thing, I, if you literally, literally have one minute, I can show you real quickly. Another thing, yeah, free sure. thing that you can do with your goalies. If you want to share, if you can, sh I can share my screen. Uh, if you want to give me the, the sharing, I can show you another thing that I love to do. That's 100% free. Absolutely. Let me go to here and you're the host, change the host, go for it. Okay. Well, let's see here. What are they? Okay, so let me share my screen. So one of the things, if you go to Google and you type in the word concentration grids, there's one that's called free number table concentration grid. I'll show you the wrong way and the right way. And this is something the kids can do for free. So if they hit this button, what you're going to see is a bunch of numbers come up. Yeah. The wrong with yeah. the goal of this is to find the number sequentially as fast as you can. Wow. The wrong way that the guys do it is they try to find the number. If they're doing it on an iPad or like my laptop, they try to find the number this way. Yeah. Here you'll get absolutely nothing out of this exercise. So the thing, and I'm going to do it slow is you got to find it with your eyes and then move the mouse to where you want it to go. So it's, you're taking, you're, you're, you're seeing, reading, reacting. So if you're get, seeing that rush come down, this is how you're training your eyes and your brain to see, scan, plan. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely does. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this, this is the, the standard grid is a 10 by 10. And the cool thing about this, every time you hit it, it's always random. And then the great thing is you can measure it. You can literally measure how well. So the, the story I always share is the first time Carter ever did this. It took him 12 and a half minutes to do. And he right. got the record minute, minute four or five seconds to complete this. Um, so it's something, you know, you know, for kids to, to work on. For, for me, um, the top guys, quiet room, no distractions. If you're an elite goalie, you're going to get somewhere between two and five minutes to get this, get this done. That's the standard one. Then what I, I get goalies to do, we got to focus for 20 minutes. So what we do is we set a timer for 20 minutes. Yeah. And now what I'm going to get the goalies to do is do a three by three. And what they're going to do is progressively build. Up. So they do a three by three and they're going to do a four by four. Then they're going to do a five by five. And in that 20 minutes, see how deep you can go in that, in that 20 minute time frame. So what you're yeah. doing is you're training your brain to um, focus for that, that, that length of time. Right. That's excellent. Now. So third version of this is um, I won't get, I can't mention the guy's name or I'll get in trouble, but he was an NHL goalie. When I worked with him, you'll probably know who I'm talking about here. Um, he was able to get the 10 by 10 down to two minute mark. Wow. But he has reputation of giving up soft goal later in the game. So yeah. one of the things I said to him, I said, forget about doing the 10 by tens. Now, now what I'd like you to do is just like cardio stamina, let's work on mental stamina. So now you can do a 15 by 15. Right. And the first time he looked at it, he was like, you're, you're kidding me. You're <laughs> absolutely like, and so that night he went home and excuse my language for the audience here. He went home and he did it. And I got this text message minutes f you and <laughs> and he worked on this and he was able to get down to 10 minutes that's within really a year that's phenomenal and he's still playing in the national hockey league i can't tell you where but he's one of the one of the the 
premier guys. Better goalies in the league. Nice. Now, the that's the third version. Yeah. The fourth version is I call it the penalty kill. So now what you're going to do is you can either do a 10 by 10 or you can do a 15 by 15 and you set it up for two minutes. Yeah. So maybe, maybe you're pressed for time that day. You got two minutes, boom. Let's see how deep you can go within that yeah. two minute time frame. Good. And so that's the four, four versions. Now this is free. It doesn't cost a cent. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're working on working memory. You're working on brain processing speed. You're working on, if you do it properly, you're working on getting a message from your eye to your brain faster. Um, so this is a free way. Now, if, because I've been told I'm not the very nicest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make it nasty. So now you're going to do that grid with the booing crowd noises. Yeah. Now you're, you're, pulling up that, you're pulling up that 10 by 10. Now you're doing it with your, your three or five hand. That's excellent. And if you're going into the business, and you keep hard, and you're not being nice, or you could get, <laughs> you know, your annoying little brother or sister while you're doing this grid, and they're simultaneously doing it to just replicate yeah. what they're going to experience on the ice. That's so really good. That's really? that's a free way. So this is to me how something like this can tie into exactly what you're doing with the one, two, three zones, the the ABC. It's just, this is a skill in my mind that your brain and your eyes are working more efficiently, which is going to allow you to bring it to, into those zones. Yeah. Have you ever seen uh, goalieframes.com? No. That's no. another really good one. It's free and they create, um, if you type it in goalieframes.com, it's um, basically, it, it shows you what the frame of the net looks like based on where the puck is. So it helps goaltenders understand how, you know, do you need to come out that far? What is the angle? What's the pitch? So you can start looking at that all the way through, but there's, there's actually one in there. If you, if you, if you look, it'll have, um, let's see here, frame shapes inside pucks may go through frames to score uh, here, free printable flashcards right there. So it's like the um, C says, get your free printable flashcards a little lower. A little higher, uh, higher, right there. Click that. So now these are free. Uh, now you can go North American rink or international. So just go North American. And then you can go in and then when it comes up, all these are bendable. So when you print them off, one side will have what the frame looks like. So go to the next one. So based on the puck's position there, the frame looks like that. Tells you how big it is, what the pitch looks like, the whole works. So then you start asking yourself, yeah. with a nine inch width, Braden, why are you, <laughs> why are you challenging? You know, we're 30, right. well, it just, it just goes around and shows you. And then there's one frame that shows all of them uh, at the same time. And it just kind of gives you an overview, but it's just got great free tool for, for kids to look at and athletes to look at, to give them a look at cognitive, you know, you've got your cognitive uh, perceptual training. Awesome. You know, the other one, the, this is free and I'm going to show you this, this guy is not totally nothing to do with goaltending, mm -hmm. but this guy, um, he had myopia of all things. And one of the things that he does is he's got all these visual tracking. He's got peripheral, um, he's got, um, visual tracking exercises. So this is the one I like to do with the kids all the time. What he, he, in this time frame, how many letter cues can you see? So what he's done, he's got all these really cool um, exercises. Um, so he's got ones for peripheral. He's got ones for tracking. So there's a tracking exercise. He's got, a, you know, he's got another, he's got about 45. And then he's got ones that just all work on your peripheral. And it's so free. Good. It doesn't so come doesn't cost you a cent That's so excellent. like by doing the grids um because i get a lot of kids that just simply can't afford to come to come yeah. to me so like when they're doing something like this right and i'm like 
like, oh, did you, I'm sure you've probably seen Connor, Connor or Braid doing it, on, or Fred on the on the bench doing these little things with their eyes. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> now is that going to make is that going to help you to see the guy off the back door? I don't know, but it will increase the probability of it might happen. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's awesome. So yeah, I thought like because like, I again I, I whatever I can do honestly, Pasco, like um because I think a lot of people um don't understand um what the cognitive perceptual is. I'm not trying to it's not to replace anything. Um, that's why I try to like, for me, it's the first thing is the flashlight needs to be on the ice surface. Right. Okay. And it, now we have to pay. Now this is where I think your battlefield. Okay. So first of all, let's get it on the play that's happening in front of us. Right. Number two, what do we need to be actually paying attention to when we're, we're doing that. And that's where I think your stuff really comes into it. And then th second thing is, okay, let's get that flashlight working more efficiently. And so yeah. that's where the, the CPT stuff comes into it. And then the third is, okay, through goalie coaching, through mental training, like this is where the mindfulness, the breath work, we got to get it to the point where we're just doing it. We're not thinking about it. We're just, we're just letting our body do what it's been trained to do. Right. And, and that's, yeah. that's why I asked you like, okay, you're getting all these zones presented. How do you get it to the point where it's just becoming second nature. Right. And, and I love it. Like, that made a lot of sense to me how, how you train it, which is yeah, and, fantastic. you know, one piece at a time. And then one end of the ice will have nothing. One end of the ice will have the, have it drawn out so that they can see it. And then they can, you know, every time the coach changes the drill, the, you know, obviously they change sides so that they get used to it. And it's pretty amazing. It's a, it's a great way to kind of teach goalie IQ without overwhelming someone and then going, Oh, I don't want to hear anymore. It's too much. So just one step at a time, master it, move on to the next one. And then you'll have to tweak it, but at least you have the information. But it's is, is my pleasure and my honor to spend some time with you today. It was great. Uh, it was really good. And we should do it again sometime. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor, for your time. Anytime. Thank you. But I'll send this information off to you later on today. Okay. Take care.